parents that are just empathetic do not create empathetic children. If their one-way empathy begets self-centeredness, it does not beget empathy. So children have to see how empathy is modeled by a parent, but a parent can't stop by being empathetic. The parent must require the child to know how to empathize with the mother and father going through, what their brother and sister is going through, and so appreciate them and be empathetic to them. Well, it's great to have you back. Thank you, AJ. It's, a, it's really, I'm looking forward to this. And Johnny and I were curious, a bit of the backstory and, and also the title. So Rollmate to Soulmate is very interesting, eye-grabbing. So can you share with our audience the title of the book and the backstory of how this book came together? Yeah, the title of the book came about from, I was doing couples communication workshops that at the very beginning I wasn't calling Rollmate to Soulmate, but then I started seeing that, you know, that everybody as they, you know, they, when they fell in love, they felt that they were soulmates and, you know, oh my, but it was really passion mates, not soulmates. And then as they started to get to know each other, particularly if they moved in together, you know, they started feeling, you know, well, why don't you put the dishes in the dishwasher rather than the sink? And why do you leave the toilet seat up? And I told mentioned that to you before. And, you know, when I first met you, you made this great dinner for me. Uh, and now you serve me leftovers and, and, you know, and all these things were happening. And then, and then people were sort of, they evolved into playing roles in their life, which didn't necessarily mean male, male doing this and the female doing that in terms of, you know, a breadwinner and being at home with the children, but they figured out, a, you know, roles that were, that were good for them. But they, oftentimes felt that they were walking on eggshells because they feared that they didn't want to criticize their partner because they knew that historically, even when they expressed a concern, that their partner would experience it as criticism and then would respond to it defensively and then that would escalate. And so I'm not in the mood and my partner's not in the mood for escalating and getting into a big argument, especially right now when we're, we're, we're going out to dinner. And so I'll just keep it to myself and I'll keep it to myself and I'll keep it to myself. And so when I talk to couples about this, they say, you know, why do, you know, why do you keep it to yourself? Because the normal outcome of my bringing up a concern is that it gets worse, that, the, you know, that, that my partner becomes defensive and it escalates and I escalate defensively to that and that. And before you know it, we're both sorry for what we said and uh, are angry and neither of us felt any felt heard. And we just go into a sort of more defunct space. So it's better just to keep it to myself, but also I am finding myself drinking. I am finding myself, you know, sort of building up this internal volca volcano. If it's a woman talking, she's talking to her woman friends about some of the things she doesn't like about her husband. If it's a man talking, he's more likely just to keep it to himself. And so it's not good for either one of them. And so I then started working on, all right, is there a way that they, that a couple could really hear each other without becoming defensive? And I realized that historically speaking, when you heard a criticism, it was a potential enemy. So it made sense to survive, to get up your defenses, or alternatively, kill the enemy before the enemy killed you. And that was wonderful for survival. It's just dysfunctional for love. And, and so I asked myself, is there a way around this? And long story short, after 30 years of working with a role mate to soulmate course people, I, I started scheduling calls about three months after I did the actual Rollmate to Soulmate workshop. And I asked people what worked and what didn't work. And I kept refining and making it better and better. And I found that one of the things that really did work was knowing how to fill the reservoir of love with appreciations and then setting aside a time that I called the caring and sharing practice in which both couples learn to be able to hear each other's perspectives but before they did, they altered their naturally biologically defensive state to be able to hear everything their partner said, even whether they disagreed with everything, even whether it was exaggerated, even if it was in a sarcastic tone of voice. And then when I had couples practice that and say these mindsets, these six mindsets out loud to their partner, their partner saw that their the person that they were about to share their concerns with was feeling was preparing themselves to really hear them. And therefore they felt safe to communicate rather than walking on eggshells. 
And then they start, the, then I taught them how to co- leave their partner feeling completely heard, completely seen, completely not distorted. And that really changed the life of almost every couple that I've had a chance to work with. And so then I started feeling upset that this was really wonderful for people who could afford the you know, the thousand to five thousand dollars to make the trip to Big Sur and Esalen or other places that I was teaching, but it was you know that is not available to everybody. So I created the online video course, which was, and then with the Rollmate to Soulmate book, basically gave that away, and so that people really could do this in depth with their partner. Well, I can definitely feel a lot of those issues in in my own relationship as much as we work on them, and I think it's hard for people when they go through that starting phase of feeling that immense amount of passion for their partner to then fall into this phase where you talk about the four depleters of love come into play. And all of a sudden we're relying on instincts, we're relying on emotion. And even with the best intentions and caring deeply about the other person, we're hurting them. And over time that hurt turns to resentment and then those relationships fail. And I think a lot of us, we, we like to think of soulmate as, oh, just perfect. Like we just match, there's no work, and I don't need to go to a course. I don't need to read a book. I don't need to watch a videos online to, to get to that place. But in actuality, that's just not how love works. And I think that's jarring for a lot of us based on what we hear in Hollywood movies and see in books and plays, et cetera, around this idea that I just need to find that perfect match. And John and I have talked a lot about this, how this then leads to people writing people off too soon in in their dating lives and ending up single and very frustrated because they're searching for something that is just not out there. Absolutely. And and the more they're soulmates, to some degree, that sort of natural connection, uh, the more vulnerable they feel. And so when a man feels that he's respected by being, you know, the protector and you know, of his wife and then his wife criticizes him, he suddenly feels like, my God, she must not respect me. And if and I know enough about her to know that if she doesn't respect me, she can't possibly love me. And, you know, the woman is often feeling like, you know, if he... Um, if he's criticizing me, he's supposed to be the person who's my nurturer, connector, and, you know, and protector. And, you know, and what is he doing? Criticizing me? I was, you know, so precious for a while. And so in a way, the more you perceive yourself as soulmates without having the way of being able to share what your concerns are, uh, the more oftentimes you find it, you, you find yourself vulnerable to being rejected or what you perceive as being rejected or criticized by your, quote, soulmate. Yeah. And I think the other part about this is we grow and change. And when you fall in love and you've been together, you know, my wife and I have been together over 10 years now, looking back on when we met, we're, we're much different people. As much as we like to think we share the same core values and, and similar mindsets, that changes over time and different career paths, different choices made. And of course, it's kind of hard to rectify that when you're feeling this passion, but at the same time, you have these concerns and and things that you want to air with your partner, and you're concerned about how that's going to be received and how you can communicate it in a way that leads to not only change and ideally healing instead of tearing apart. You you are so right, and it's that's really an important thing to remember is, you know, most people who are married 60, 70 years and, you know, they're on their, near their deathbeds. And the question is asked, what's the secret and to your marriage? And the answer will often be something like, well, I, there has been four different marriages here, (laughs) you know, know, and particularly the marriage becomes different when you have children. Children are the, the, you know, the big game changer because you're not only talking about who you are as people, but what your philosophy is on raising children and whatever your philosophy is on raising children, you find out that it's basically half right and half wrong. (laughs) And you uh, (laughs) you know, no, no one without children is, is an expert on children because it's a, you know, it's, and it's, it's a little bit like, you know, writing a book. When I write a book, you know, I, I perceive it to be something, but then the book almost becomes its own person after a while. And you start seeing that you discover things. Um, and with children, you especially discover things that are, you know, how much discipline, how much lenience, how much nurse, nurturance, you know, when to enforce a boundary, when to be forgiving, you know, and then the child, you know, and then you have a brother and a sister and you, or two brothers or two sisters or three or four children. And, you know, you know, 
wait, why are you treating Jimmy this way when you tr- treated me this way? And, you know, and, you know, why were you so protective to the oldest child and less protective to the youngest child? And, you know, there, there's nothing about fairness <laughs> that, is, <laughs> in, that could easily be uh, j- justified in, in raising a child. And so it's, and therefore the mother and father, you know, get into not just the disagreements, but how to do what I call uh, enrollment to soulmate checks and balance parenting so that you don't, you know, that you, that each partner understands what the rationale is of the other partner. Why mom doesn't like it when the daughter cries, when dad teases her. Why is dad doing the teasing to the point where the daughter cries? What is there a positive function of teasing? Yes, there is. But you don't see that when your daughter is crying because you're, you're moving into a protector instinct that, uh, the, that overpowers anything that's rational. And so how do you set aside time to hear your partner when you're not in the crisis mode? And that's, you know, what the caring and sharing practice is, is about not only to spend the time doing that, but to know how to do that. And everything I advise in the caring and sharing practice, as you probably already noticed, AJ, is biologically unnatural. It's really about making an evolutionary shift. And that's what intrigued me about writing Role Mate to Soulmate is that I always want to write a book where where the problem is very large in society, but there's no solution that's been discovered yet. And I think that is a key distinction because people hear relationships are work. And we have different definitions of work, but I think it really distills down to you moving beyond just your biological urges and actually moving to a place of true partnership with the other person. And then, of course, as we bring in children and the family grows, the family unit and understanding that. So you might have this natural innate inclination when in conflict to respond in a certain way, but when you're with your partner and you're you're building a family, that's not a healthy way to respond to maintain that relationship. And that's really what the work is that we do in a relationship to keep falling in love with all the different per- versions of our partner that we'll get the joy to experience. Absolutely. And to let your partner know. So in the caring and sharing practice, I make it really clear that this is a, a once a week practice where you start out giving two sets of appreciations to your partner. And I teach couples how to appreciate each other, not just generally, but very specifically. So if it's Thanksgiving coming up and I say to you know, my wife in front of the in front of company, you know, you, you're really, you know, Liz, my wife's name, Liz is really a good cook. And yeah, you know, Liz feels appreciated by that, but she's been told that a half a dozen times or a hundred times. And, you know, it goes in one ear and out the other. But if I say, you know, how did you get that crisp, the, the, the turkey's skin so crisp? Now she's feeling like she's being called upon as an expert in doing something and she sees that I really see something of value to what she's done. And if I move to the next level and say, well, you know, how did you get the dressing so moist? And, and how did you do that at the same time that you got the, the skin crisp and the dressing moist? How do, how do, you, how do you manage that? And then I say, well, I really love the spices. Well, it's nice to say I really love the spices, but what spices did you sense? And so if I say, you know, I, I really love that, maybe was it parsley, sage, rosemary, thyme, or some other Simon and Garfunkel spice? She really sees that I've paid attention to the, the spices, the caring, the choices of spices, and all those challenges. And when I show both curiosity and appreciation at a very, at what I train my couples to do, five levels of specificity, then the partner really feels seen. So the caring and sharing process starts out with each partner sharing two appreciations of each other. But then the really tough stuff is how do I alter my naturally biological propensity for defensiveness and change it temporarily to a, to a new propensity to be able to hear my partner's criticism in such a way that allows them to feel completely heard. And so I'll give you one example of that. I asked them to, to, do, to read out loud or to say out loud to their partner something I call the love guarantee. And the love guarantee is the person about ready to hear their partner's criticism it says, I know you will feel more loved by me if I provide a safe environment for everything you want to say even if I 100% disagree with the content, even if you say it in a a rough or angry or shouting tone of, or sarcastic tone of voice, 
I will then nevertheless know that it's what I want to do is provide a safe environment for you saying that in whatever way you wish. And if I do that, you'll feel more secure with me, less like you have to walk on eggshells. You'll feel more loved by me, and therefore you'll feel more loved for me. And the more you exaggerate or shout, the more you will expect to not feel security with me. And if I nevertheless provide security, you'll have even a deeper level of appreciation, a deeper feeling of security, a deeper feeling of being loved by me, and therefore more love for me. So let me not be threatened by the exaggeration of the shouting, but let me see it as an opportunity to be more deeply loved. That's the love guarantee. And so when he or she, the receiver of criticism, meditates into that, but meditates, says that out loud, the person about ready to share their concern can begin to see, is seeing that they're safe because their partner is preparing themselves to be safe. My most fun mindset to give one more is I have every couple in the workshop, I sit back to back, take out a yellow pad, and to write down on the yellow pad the answer to the following. You're with your partner and she or he is about ready to be killed, either in a car accident or say drown, let's say, with 100% certainty that you can save their life. But you also know that you have about a 50% chance of dying yourself if you save their life. Would you be willing to take that chance? Yes, no, uncertain. Your partner will never see your answer and just eliminate the the factor of, if you have children, eliminate the concern of children. Just take that in an isolated way. And about 90% of the men and about 80% of the women say yes, they would be willing to risk their life at a 50% level to save their partner's life. And I give them a couple of options if they're in that 20% or 10%. But that's the general thing. So the first mindset I ask everybody to do is to say, if I'm willing to die for you, well, the least I can do is listen to you. (laughs) And it puts the job of listening in perspective. And so there's about six mindsets like that. And as I was mentioning before, those mindsets, the six mindsets that have survived are the ones that that the majority of people have increasingly said three months afterwards when they practice this each week, that this is the mindset that really helped them center themselves and help them feel like they're, they are ready to give their partner a deeper amount of internal security and not move into defensiveness. You know, I think for a lot of people who do not view coaching or relationship counseling as a plus, they tend to go there when the relationship has already hit rock bottom or is on its way to rock bottom. And what people don't understand in that case is that those lines of communication, if you've let it get that bad, have been utterly destroyed. And those lines of communication need to be rebuilt. So those mindsets seem to help in reestablishing those lines of communication so that uh, the couple can then begin to communicate again. And for Lord knows how long they haven't been, if they're coming to a counselor or to one of your group sessions after they've already destroyed the relationship and trying to pick up the pieces. You're absolutely right. I think one of the things that inspired me to put this into book form was seeing that a significant number of couples, usually about a quarter of the couples attending the workshop, are on the in this type of situation that you're talking about. And so, and some of them have filed for divorce already. Um, <laughs> and so a very high percentage of those that file for divorce say on Monday after the workshop's over, we're go- we both agreed that we're going into the, we're calling the attorney and saying, let's unfile for divorce because they just had no idea that they could be heard or seen like this. And what was more important is that they had a method they could use every week. And I had drummed it into their head that they needed to use this every week because this requires practice. And it's, you know, once you learn it, it's not going to, there's, you know, there's 23 love enhancements that I have built into the Role Mate to Soulmate course and the book. And you're not going to be able to remember them. You're not going to be able to, unless you practice them. And so let me be realistic about this. This is not 
you know, read it once, oh, I got it and do it. This requires an evolutionary shift and an evolutionary shift doesn't happen by just attending a workshop or just even reading the book. And that's why I created the, the online video version that I'm practically giving away with the book because of, of that. Now, th- what else happens with that that we haven't touched on and we, and we should put such some light on it just for our audience's sake of why we're discussing this, which is modernity whether on purpose or just the way it is set up, attacks relationships. It attacks nuclear families. You wrote extensively about how it hurts the boys and and the boy crisis. And when we're discussing before the show, a lot of the policies that led to the problems that you wrote about in the boy crisis have not been fixed. And our nuclear family is being attacked through modernity. We know how addictive our devices are. We know how toxic a lot of the ideas that are floating around are. And again, if you think you're just going to meet somebody, have children, and have a perfect relationship, you're sadly mistaken because there's a lot of things that are taken aim at you, your relationship, and your happiness. You're absolutely right. And so uh, two things on the modernity issue is that the what we what I found when I did the research for the boy crisis was that the children that were most vulnerable were more the boys and the girls, but both children without dads had challenges on more than 70 different metrics, committing suicide, not doing well in school, becoming failures to launch, dropping out of high school, taking drugs or drinking, being addicted to porn, on and on and on. But I did find a huge difference between the children that had mom and dad at home raising them and the ones that didn't, especially ones that had an involved dad that were not dad deprived. But even if they had a dad that was doing what I call the father's catch 22, that is, he interpreted his role when the child was born to be away from the family earning money rather than being with the children directly. Even among those children, they knew their father was coming back. And if father was at least involved some weekends, they had that security. But it was the ones particularly that uh, in divorce situations that had challenges. And then there was another group that you talk about that that is an outcome of modernity uh, for sure. And that is that 40% of women today who have children have children 40% without being married. Now, some of these women have children with a man that they're living with. However, a live-in relationship with a child lasts an average of three and a half years. And then after that three and a half years, oftentimes what's lost is the father. There's a divorce. There's sometimes anger at the father. And the child is looking, the boy child in particular, is looking in the mirror and seeing that there's a divorce. He has very little contact with his father. But as he looks in that mirror, he sees, you know, he remembers hearing from mom, you know, that your dad is a liar. He's irresponsible. And he's, you know, a narcissist. And the child's looking in the mirror and seeing that, you know, he has the, 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 the nose, the eyes, the hair of the father, and that maybe he's a narcissist who's a liar, who's irresponsible. And there's no child that can't figure out times when he's been those ways. And so you, he begins to worry that maybe he is inherently like his dad, but he can't talk to his dad about it because he doesn't want to destabilize the relationship more by having the dad and mom get into an argument. Can't talk to the mom about it because she's taking care of him every day and still doesn't want to destabilize that. But that's problem of modernity to a greater degree because we never had a period in history before where 40% of women were having children without being married. The other thing that's much more of a, a function of modernity is the is the divorce option. Children, boys are doing worse than girls in all 63 of the largest developed nations. What's common among developed nations? Developed nations usually have mastered a greater deal of survival skills than less developed nations. So developed nations can give people the option of having a divorce. Less developed nations are focused on survival and they can't allow the social permission or the legislative permission for divorce nearly as easily. But once you have survival taken care of, then you look for things like a happy life and a fulfilled life. And so I'm not being fulfilled with my husband, with my wife. So therefore, I want the option of divorcing. You don't worry about that if you can barely survive. You do pay attention to that once you can survive. Just one last point on the divorce situation. Children who are old enough, eight, nine, ten, they start to 
to figure things out. And the minute there is a rift in that parental structure, they will exploit it. I certainly did when I was a, a young teenager and, and saw that in my family. I used their getting divorced as leverage to get the things that I wanted. It doesn't take very much for a child to figure that he can play both of them off, which only divides everything even further. Three answers to that question. Yes, yes, and yes. And then the third comment, I'm just shocked that you would ever have thought of doing that as a child. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing that I do want to point out that was strong in the book too is, is the idea that success in your career, those skills do not translate to success in love. And one feature or bug of modernity is now the cost of raising a family requires two working partners. It requires both parents being active in the workforce for most people, for majority of people now. And with that, we're now bringing these skills that help us in our career into our relationships, and they do not work to create the functioning, healthy relationship communication that we need to be successful. But a lot of us can't untangle ourselves from that because work has become 24-7, 365. Yes. So let's deal with that. There's two very important things there. One is the success love tension, the, the tension between success at work and love at home. And I'll uh, spend a minute on that. And the other one is the belief of what is needed to make a couple happy or to make a family happy. So one of the interesting studies was the Harvard University's 80 year longitudinal study on happiness. And what they discovered was that if for a family of four, depending on where you live in the United States, it takes about six, somewhere between sixty dollars and $90,000 a year to raise a family of four in a way that if you have more than that, once you've reached that level, that happiness is achievable more by additional time with the family than it is by additional time at work. And so it's really important for most people to hear, hear that because we, we almost always as a family of four or a family of two or three, increases their income, they start having aspirations for things that cost more income, better home, better neighborhood, and so on. But the studies of who, which families are happy are the ones that base amount, that's what I would call survival amount, is achieved. The additional time is worth more than the additional dime. The second is the, the what you pointed out, and I'm really glad you saw this in Role Mate to Soulmate, AJ, is the, the tension between the qualities it takes to be successful at work and the qualities that it takes to be successful in love. So for example, let's say you're top executive at Boeing and you have eight salespeople trying to sell you a, a better door, let's say. <laughs> and so to be a good CEO, you listen for a while and you start asking yourself questions inside of yourself. You start self-listening. And you listen to yourself say, is this person have a good reputation? Does this person, what, have they sold other things in the past? Have they worked? How can I fit this into my Jap Japanese infrastructure? Uh, we're having a lot of people quit at Boeing here, and we're firing a lot of people. How will the new people be able to adapt to this particular method? And so you're, you're doing a hundred functional thing. You're having your self-listening in a number of ways that are very functional for being a good CEO. So if you're really doing that for years, your brain gets wired to self-listen. So now you take that wired brain to self-listen and you come home to your wife or your children or your husband or your children, and you find that your husband or your wife is saying that they've had a really challenging day at work and you listen to them for a few seconds and then you start thinking in your, you start self-listening. You say, oh, I have a solution to that. And particularly if you're a male executive and you love your wife and your wife is having challenges, when a man loves a woman and a woman is having challenges, it's like for a man, a woman's bleeding. And your instinct as a man is like, if you care about my wife, if I care about my wife, there's nothing I would consider doing than stopping that bleeding by putting a, this Band-Aid on that bleeding. But the way to put the Band-Aid on the bleeding is not by giving her a solution. It's by the, the way to solve the problem is allowing her to just listen. Now, women who are top executives end up having the same problem also, not only with their husbands, but also with their children. Men have it to a deeper degree, proportionally, but both are the wrong solution. So the qualities it takes to be successful at work 
which is self-listening is included in those qualities, are in tension with the qualities it takes to be successful at love. And the way that I can get through to top executives about that is that when you just listen and then follow listening with more listening, and then you share, and then your wife says to you, uh, she pauses, instead of coming up with a solution, just stop with knowing that you've already solved the problem by listening. Now, what about if she asks you for your ideas? Just to say, I'll be happy to offer you an idea or two, but do you have any ideas? Oftentimes, as a person takes the time to vent, they have ideas in their mind as to possible solutions. And it honors that person to ask for their ideas first, and then maybe offer your own ideas afterwards. But the solution is listening, followed by listening, followed by asking your wife or your children's or your husband's and children's perspectives on what they've vented about. Yeah. And I I know it in my own relationship. We talk about it with our clients, how important it is to recognize when someone is seeking emotional validation and not solutions to problems. But when we've worked in an environment that's 24-7, 365 solutioning, I got a Slack notification, I got an email in my inbox, and I got a solution, whatever that message is. It's hard then to put on your validation hat when you get home with your partner and listen and listen and listen to problems that you internally feel like you already have solutions for without just blurting it out and wanting to move forward with dinner and then get back to the other solutions at work that you need to solve. Absolutely. absolutely. And it's, and you know, this is really something biological. I mean, when you are becoming successful and you, you begin to hone the art of solving problems and self-listening to do that, listening to yourself, begin to hone solutions while somebody else is talking. And your brain begins to adapt to that and neurons connect in a certain way. And then you come back home and those neurons are still connecting that way. You're just, you, you learn to do, you know, a very, very good quick solution. And so that's important. Part of what needs to come up in the caring and sharing time is, you know, helping the other person know, you know, that time when you really listen to me and you just listen to me. And then I asked you for some ideas and you said, well, I'll be happy to give them, but you know, what are your ideas first? I felt so called upon. I felt so validated. I felt so heard. Or conversely, sharing in a caring and sharing time that, you know, that when you just interrupt me like that and, you know, come up with an idea, I feel on some level that you're saying that you could figure out in about a few seconds what I couldn't figure out in a lifetime. And I know you're trying to help me, but somehow or other that didn't make me feel honored. I want to touch on the appreciation piece because I I think it dovetails with what I've also experienced in my own life from family and friends, which is when one partner chooses then to do kin work, that kin work is not rewarded in the same way that you're rewarded in your career with promotions, salary increases, achievement awards, recognition, and call outs. That kin work is head down. In large part, the child is not able for most of their lives to appreciate what's going on. They're just trying to survive and you're trying to help support them. And then your partner is struggling now on a single income, trying to lean heavier into work to unlock more income to support the family. And it creates a situation where there is no appreciation happening and both partners feel unappreciated. And one thing that we recognized in our relationship was it is important to create a routine. So for us, it's Friday night, date night. And we hope once we start a family to continue this routine with some help and support, but for the two of us to come together at the end of each week and to be appreciative of one another and to be grateful for what we have as a a couple. And we have not skipped a Friday, even while traveling, even when work stuff has come up, we've always carved that out. And it's just been there. It's been foundational to our relationship. And when we have had struggles with communication, we know that that Friday is coming up to help us solve that. So instead of looking at it like, okay, now I need to rush to read the book and I got to solve this. How about you create a habit and routine with your partner to work on having that consistent communication, that consistent opportunity to appreciate and be grateful for one another before we even introduce the criticism so that we are in a regular cadence keeping connected with our partner, recognizing that there's so many other distractions going on outside of our relationship that easily suck our attention away. Boy, I so agree with that, AJ. And when you move to that next level and you have children, 
one of the most functional things I think I, that I talk about in Rollmate to Soulmate is creating family dinner nights without creating family dinner nightmares. And the uh, the first step, as you know, I say in, in that is no electronics at the table. And you know, I teach people, you know, parents. Sometimes parents will say to me something like, "Oh, you know, I tell my children no electronics at the table, and then they still bring electronics at the table." And I say, "You know something? You're the child. the The child is the parent. Uh, you know, but what do you mean? I have no leverage." Excuse me. Do you do you cook a meal for your child? Do you cook? Do you give them? Do you prepare desserts for your child? Do you take them to places? Do you buy them things? Any that's you have more leverage than you know. I, we could sit here and develop your leverage for an hour's worth of itemized things that you do for your child. And at that family dinner night, once the electronics are away from the table, and you have enforcement mechanisms to do that, the next thing is to require to teach everyone in the family dinner nights how to do those appreciations at multiple levels of specificity. What do you appreciate about your brother, your sister? Ah, you know, <laughs> after you get through the ah. No, I'm sorry. You don't have the option of just ending with ah. If you want to end this family dinner night and get to your back to your video games, you're going to actually appreciate uh, something about my sister, uh, my brother. Oh, they're my brother. Uh, you know, and then you teach them the, you know, the f- five levels of specificity and they'll hate it. And, you know, at first, and that's what part of what you require at that family dinner night in order for them to be, quote, be released from family dinner night. And then you as a parent, you, you model a appreciating each of the children, but then you also ask the children to appreciate you and their brother and sister. Why? Because parents that are just empathetic do not create empathetic children. If their one-way empathy begets self-centeredness, it does not beget empathy. So children have to see how empathy is modeled by a parent, but a parent can't stop by being empathetic the parent must require the child to know how to empathize with the mother and father going through what their brother and sister is going through. And so appreciate them and be empathetic to them. The people who understand this and catch this most quickly are teachers. Oftentimes, there'll be a, a very empathetic, warm, loving child in the class, and the teacher will be expecting to meet a parents that are very empathetic and warm and you know that type of thing. And oftentimes, they find parents that are a little bit that way, but that are also quite, you know, they're quite disciplined in their orientation. And the reverse, oftentimes they have children that are very self-centered and they'll meet parents who are loving and empathetic and appreciative. And they begin to see that one-way empathy does not beget empathy, it begets uh, self-centeredness. Well, we're huge fans of appreciation. And we believe that, and we teach our clients, that it deepens every relationship in your life, not just with your partners or with your children. So I'd love to unpack the five levels of appreciation to help our audience. Because I think, and when we introduce this in our class, a lot of times when we think of appreciation, we think of external things like, oh, I love that shirt you're wearing, or hey, Johnny, thank you for getting your hair done before the show here. It's looking great. But those surface level things that anyone can appreciate us by really carry no weight in a relationship. And when we're talking about people we really want to deepen a relationship with, it takes a level of thoughtfulness, validation, understanding, and really care to appreciate someone deeply. So how can we as partners and as friends appreciate others uh, better? Yes, actually, I'll even take that to a more challenging level. Let's say you're getting together at Thanksgiving or uh, the holidays and you're meeting with your family members. And of course, everybody's desire is to increase the love and closeness. That's what family's about. But you know, one of them just voted for Trump and the other one just voted com- for Kamala Harris. And you just can't understand why one of them would do whatever is different from what you are doing. And in the past, you've gotten into arguments about this. And so you've decided that, you know, the best way to do this is don't discuss politics, don't discuss religion. But that's kind of sad because politics and religion are reflections of people's values. And isn't it sad to get together with somebody you love and want to deepen your appreciation for and love for and just ignore all these areas because they may create conflict? Wouldn't it be wonderful to really understand what's the virtue behind these values? And so the first thing that that I would have, uh, what I train couples to do, so once they, they learn all the techniques that I teach in the workshop for their interpersonal communication as a couple, I then ask people in the workshop who have different political views to work on hearing each other. 
And so the first step is what I call alone power. So you might say to your brother or your sister or your cousin, I'd really love to understand and hear your perspective on things. And I'm willing to do that alone for you until you feel fully seen for the values you have and appreciated for the values you have, even if they're different than mine. I would love it if at the end you do this for me as well, but that's not a requirement. I just want to do this for you. So the first step is what I call alone power. The second step is appreciating them. So you say, well, I remember when when we were kids and, you know, and you, um, let's say the sister's talking to a brother and say, you know, I remember, especially this time, our early Thanksgivings and, you know, and Uncle Joe said this and I disagreed with him. I think you disagreed with him, but you stood up and you, you t- said to Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe, I have, you know, a different perspective on that. I remember you reading stuff about that perspective. And so you, you, kept, you kept, I appreciate so much how you kept yourself informed. I also appreciated the fact that I didn't have the guts to stand up to Uncle Joe, but you did. And you did it very nicely. You didn't just yell at him. You just said, Uncle Joe, here's my perspective on that. Do you agree? And Uncle Joe didn't agree, but you stayed with it. And you weren't ruled by the need to get approval all the time. I so respected that about you. So what have we done here? As you can see that those appreciations were at multiple levels. The, 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 the sister didn't say to the brother or vice versa, you know, I think you were really a great kid, uh, something, you know, um, or, you know, I always liked the dresses you wore or the, you know, or the clothes you wore, things like that. But you rather really got to the core of who they were as a human being, how they expressed themselves, the courage that they had, the ability to articulate, the ability to read and so on. Now, eventually you're going to have a different perspective than than that person, but that person has just felt appreciated at multiple levels. And that sort of is, is a very important entry into being able to feel that they are going to eventually be willing to hear a perspective that's different. Another thing that you do is you find one of the wisdoms in Rollmate to Soulmate is the wisdom of every virtue taken to its extreme becomes a vice. And so people like Tim Walsh and Jeff Walsh, Tim Walsh is the potential vice president's brother who has not spoken to Jeff. Jeff has not spoken to Tim for eight years, he says, because of Tim's progressive ideology. And so one of the things that might happen is Jeff feels that feminism is all about cancel culture and things like that, very anti-male and is always talking about the patriarchy and men as the oppressors and women as the oppressed. But instead of saying that, he starts out with, asking himself, what's the virtue in feminism? The virtue in feminism may have gone on the virtue train so far that it moved into vice land. But for a few minutes, pay attention to the original virtue. And so search, this requires discipline. Search for somebody in your life, maybe your daughter, maybe your wife, who generations ago before feminism would never have considered becoming an executive or a scientist. And your daughter is now talking about wanting to do that type of profession. And everybody else around her is open to seeing her as being capable of doing that and doesn't feel it's against, you know, that she should just be a homemaker or, you know, a secretary, a nurse or whatever, a teacher, but she should be able to do anything that she wishes to do with her life. So is there anybody in your life who has benefited from these doors that feminism has opened? If so, sharing that with Tim. And then when it gets to the reverse, instead of focusing on the the, the cancel culture dimensions or the anti-male dimensions of feminism, you both appreciate the virtue first. The next is to look at what you have in common. Okay, so Tim and Jeff Walls, what do they have in common? Or what does your brother or sister have in common with you if you're both having very different political opinions? You are both caring. Neither of you is apathetic. You may have six other people at your your Thanksgiving dinner table, or maybe 12 other people that don't really care about these issues. But what is democracy based on? It's based on caring. It's based on not being apathetic. So this is what you both have in common more than anybody else at the, our dinner table. We both care. We both end up being apathetic and not being apathetic. And then you move into the the caring and sharing process that I discussed before. 
let me hear not just the virtues, but let, let me hear what your perspective is on this. You know, why do you feel feminism is awful? Why do you feel feminism is good? Why do you think that guns are crucial? Why do you think that guns are American society's sickness? And so on. And no matter what the, uh, the perspective is, your job is not to argue with it. Your job is to be in an altered state while and share what you heard the person you disagree with say until they feel that even if you disagree with them, that you have at least heard what they said in the way that they said it, that you haven't distorted anything, that you haven't missed anything, and that you're inviting them to even add something more. When that, when that process is finished, and then you end it with new appreciations, your brother or sister or somebody in your family will feel so loved and so understood. And there's zero requirement for anybody to change their opinions about the politics. They just need to know that you're not holding them as the devil. Yeah, that distortion and inability to fully appreciate another person's values and opinions can cause a ton of damage in any relationship. I can't even imagine in a sibling relationship like the Walls family. I think it's important to recognize in in all of these situations, we're talking about relationships that we care deeply about and we we want to continue. (laughs) So there are always going to be edge cases where maybe the relationship isn't healthy, but in relationships that are healthy that you care about the other person, it's important to bring that level of appreciation, the openness to the criticism, and then also a big skill set is learning how to apologize to really solve conflict in your relationship. And oftentimes some of these criticisms are being levied at us because there is a wrong that happened and we need to apologize. And you break down a four-part apology that I think is really powerful for those who are struggling in relationships where a simple, I'm sorry, or I'll do better next time, isn't cutting it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so if somebody says, Krista told me that you didn't, that she was cold on the way to school today, you didn't give her a coat, that's really not cool. And Krista's really upset. It was really a, a guy cold. She could, and you know how subject she is to a cold. And so a defensive response might be something like, oh, thanks. You know, I'm really um, happy you once again saw the th- mistakes I made. Maybe someday you could point out something that I do right as if you'd even bother to notice. You know, that would be like <laughs> the opposite of the four-part apology. And the uh, four-part apology would look much more like something like a thank you in a tone of voice that shows sincerity. And then agreement that I really don't, I certainly don't want um, uh, Krista to get a cold. What I'll do differently next time is make sure that I check the weather and maybe do a little bit of margin for error and give Krista something else to take with her in case it does get colder. And then fourth is the tone of voice. You can say all those words in a tone of voice that has sarcasm attached to it, and it's all they're all lost. But the tone of voice is, is crucial in addition to the acknowledgement of the, of the issue and then the willingness to do it differently the next time. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that in a lot of these situations, apology is not enough. A recognition of not only where the error was, but how we can improve next time, how important it is to get this right to go along with that apology in a tone that actually welcomes the other person's perspective in instead of putting up a wall or withdrawing, which I've certainly struggled with in my own relationship. And as we go through the book and we go through this conversation, I I know that there are some in our audience who feel completely time-starved, completely overwhelmed with work and familial obligations and things going on outside of their relationship. What advice do you have for those couples who are struggling to find the time in their life to do some of these important things that we've just covered in this episode to mend and strengthen their relationships. So what I find is once somebody does this, then they see, my God, how much time I have saved. So much of the time when I'm walking on eggshells about a concern, half of my psyche is thinking about that, how to say that, when to say that. Every On some level, I know that every cell in my body is being sort of poisoned, that I will live less long because of the stress, and that I will do the compensatory behavior like drinking or maybe you know doing some drugs or playing a video game or you know watching something useless on TV just to relax and un- undo my body. If I add up all that time and add up the, the stress that it takes in my body, that's a lot more time 
than the couple of hours a week that I'm being asked to first appreciate my partner, be appreciated by my partner, and listen to one concern that they have. And knowing how to do the other part of what's talked about a rollmate to soulmate, create a conflict-free zone, and then sustain that free zone for the entire week leaves me with so much more internal relaxation and peace of mind. And knowing that the one concern I might have, I have ways of working with that concern, journaling with it, doing things that will allow me to process it. And if it survives as a concern at the end of the week, that my wife or my husband or my partner will be there to be able to hear me, even if I mistakenly frame it, even if I exaggerate it, even if I tell, get upset in the process of, of, of telling it, what a joy that is to know that, what a source of internal peace that is. I couldn't agree more. And I think having that weekly practice is just so powerful for your relationship, the relationships that really matter in our lives. Thank you so much for joining us again. And I appreciate this book. We know the last time you were here, we talked about the boy crisis and how important it is to have healthy romantic partnership relationships and healthy families. So we really appreciate the work that you're doing. Where can our audience find out more about the book and the online course to help them in their relationships? The online course is so important that I'm basically practically giving it away when somebody buys the uh, Rollmate to Soulmate book. And fortunately, Amazon right now has a 30% discount on the Rollmate to Soulmate book. So that's probably the easiest way to get it. If you have a bit more money, please go to your local bookstore and support it. That's very important as well. And then don't just read Rollmate to Soulmate as a book. Really practice with your partner, your loved one, the online video um, course. If you go through that course with your partner and it doesn't work for you, my email is in the book uh, with a guarantee that I'll give you full money back. I don't want anybody to ever feel that anything that they bought from me is not worthwhile. Well, thank you again for stopping by. We really appreciate it. It's been really wonderful talking to you. I can feel the kindness in every vibration in your body and your, your wife is a very lucky woman. Thank you. I appreciate it.